Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sydney, and if you are new here, this is just a place where we can talk about true crime, spooky, scary stories, basically anything I got going on my, in my brain, we sit down and we talk about it. So this is actually supposed to come out during spooky season, but I unfortunately had some audio issues, and I really hope that this video is better. Um, I really try my hardest to make sure that the video and audio quality is the best for you guys, although I know it doesn't seem like it sometimes. Please bear with me as I try to figure out what works best for both me and you guys as viewers. I do just want to say that this week's topic is true crime related, so that being said, there will be talk of violence, crime scenes, things like that, as well as a lot of talk about mental health issues and people dealing with those issues. So if you are sensitive to any of those things, feel free to skip this video and I'll see you next week. But now that that is out of the way, let's get into today's story. Do you guys remember that string of TikToks in 2021 where this girl found an entire other apartment behind her medicine cabinet? This video details her exploration as she travels through her medicine cabinet with the aid of a hammer just for protection and she explores this whole other apartment that she just randomly happened upon wow this is a whole other apartment these videos took the internet by storm but this is no new nightmare this has actually been an ongoing problem since the 1980s and today we're gonna to be talking about it. Let's get into Ruthie Mae McCoy and her life in the Chicago projects. So around 8.45 p.m. on April 22, 1987, 52-year-old Ruthie Mae McCoy called 911 to report something very strange. I'm a resident at 1440 West 13th Street, and some people next door are totally tearing this down. You know, what are they doing, ma'am? They want to break in? Yeah, they throw the cabinet down. From where? I'm in the projects, on the other side. You can reach, you can reach my bathroom. They want to get in through the bathroom. All right, ma'am, at what address? 1440 West 13th Street, apartment 1109. The elevator's working. 1109, all right. What's your name, ma'am? Ruth McCoy. All right, I'll send you the police. Little did the police or dispatch know the true horrors that Ruthie Mae McCoy was about to experience. Ruthie Mae McCoy was born on January 13, 1935 in Arkansas. She and her family then moved to the south side of Chicago when Ruthie Mae was in high school, although she only went there for a short time. She began to show signs of mental illness in her mid to late 20s, and because of this, she was in and out of different mental health institutions, and therefore she didn't really have a job or a steady income. She would later be diagnosed with residual type schizophrenia, which from what I understand is very much like schizophrenia, although sometimes you can act completely normal, and then other times you have very characteristic signs of schizophrenia. Allegedly, Ruthie went on and off her medication sometimes, which then exasperated her mental health struggles as well. To make matters even more complicated, Ruthie had a baby when she was 27 years old, and this baby girl would stay with family members a lot because Ruthie May was often in and out of the mental health facilities, and she couldn't properly take care of her child. So Ruthie ended up moving into the Chicago housing projects, not really by choice. Her previous house had flooded and she had tried to get a house near the rest of her family on the south side of Chicago, but unfortunately everything fell through, so she ended up in the Grace Abbott home. So in order to better understand the apartment that Ruthie Mae McCoy just moved into, we need to talk about the ABLA housing projects. The particular complex that Ruthie was staying in was a seven-story brick L-shaped apartment complex. These apartments were originally built in the 1950s and they were made for black tenants only. The ABLA housing project meticulously screened and gave background checks to everybody that moved in. So when the housing project first opened, the ABLA homes and the Grace Abbott home were generally speaking a pretty safe place to live besides the gang violence, which was always there. That being said, by the 1970s, the Chicago Housing Authority stopped doing all of their background checks 
and all of their renovations and basically just left the tenants to fend for themselves. This led all of the ABL homes to become decrepit, graffiti, and crime-filled very quickly. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. If you're wondering what I'm doing, <laughs> I'm just here to fill you in on a little part of today's story because the camera that I use is being a little piece of work and um, yeah, so I'm here to fill you in on the video parts that did not record. So anyway, we'll pick up where we left off. Basically, crime rates were twice as high in the Chicago projects than they were in the entire rest of the Chicago area. At any point, people could be harassed or attacked, and sometimes it was by people that didn't even live in the Chicago projects. It was a really scary place to live during that time. So the first few years that Ruthie May lived in the Grace Abbott home, she lived with her daughter, her daughter's boyfriend, and her daughter's children. Things were going pretty well, but once they all moved out and Ruthie was by herself, she quickly became cranky and depressed. Her mental health began to decline again, and she became obsessed with not only her own security, but the security of her neighbors. She would often be seen going from door to door, jiggling on people's doorknobs and cussing them out if their door wasn't locked. Records also showed that the Chicago Housing Project actually came to Ruthie's apartment two times while she was living there to change her locks. That being said though, when Ruthie called 911 on that April night, things were actually looking up for her. Evidence showed that Ruthie had recently applied and been approved for Supplemental Security Income, or SSI which meant that Ruthie would have her first consistent income in a really long time. Not only that, but this would basically double the assistance that Ruthie was already getting, and this was a really big deal. With this newfound money, Ruthie allegedly bought herself some new clothes, nothing fancy really, but if you lived in the housing projects, this would definitely be noticeable, as many of the people that live there couldn't afford nicer or newer things. Evidence also showed that she was attending classes to receive her GED. Allegedly in 1986, Ruthie actually reported to the Chicago Housing Authority that somebody had broken and stolen some of her things, but no corrective action or no police involvement happened. And now, it seems like something very similar was happening to Ruthie. So the dispatcher, unaware that Ruthie was in any real danger, put the call down as a disturbance with a neighbor. Other tenants began to call 911 shortly after Ruthie to report hearing banging, shouting, and gunshots near Ruthie's apartment. This prompted an additional set of police officers to make their way towards the Grace Abbott home. About 15 minutes after Ruthie had made her initial call, the first set of police officers showed up at Ruthie's door and knocked, but they didn't get a response. They then got the dispatcher to call Ruthie's apartment and they could hear Ruthie's phone ringing through the door, but nobody seemed to answer or they didn't even hear any movement of anybody trying to answer the phone. When that didn't work, the officers then went around to Ruthie's neighbors and asked them if they had heard anything strange, but nothing really came from it. The other two officers that had been dispatched to Ruthie's apartment then made their way over to the property's management building to try to get a key to Ruthie's apartment. They did manage to get a key, but it did not fit to Ruthie's door. Without seeing any other options, the authorities left Ruthie's apartment building less than an hour after they had been called. The following day, a neighbor of Ruthie's called the police to do a wellness check on Ruthie. Apparently, Ruthie always stopped at this neighbor's apartment to chat whenever she came or left her apartment. So when the neighbor didn't hear or see Ruthie at all that day, she became really, really worried. The police returned, and this time they had the Chicago Housing Authority security in tow so that they could try to get into Ruthie's apartment. The police actually wanted to break into Ruthie's apartment, like that was their plan. They were going to break down that door and see if she was in there. But the Chicago Housing Authority security team was like, mm, you could get sued if Ruthie's in there and she's fine. She could be really mad at you guys. And then we would have to fix the door and that's too much work. We don't want to do that. So ultimately, the police and the security guards just left Ruthie's apartment without getting a hold of her. So the next day, Ruthie's neighbor decided to skip calling the police and she just 
immediately contacted the project manager of the building and this official came and they came with a carpenter. The carpenter was able to get into Ruthie's apartment and what they found was extremely disturbing. When they entered, they found the apartment very messy as if somebody had scavenged through it. And when they reached the bedroom, they found Ruthie dead on the floor in a pool of her own blood. Police soon arrived on the scene and Ruthie was taken to the Cook County Hospital where she was later pronounced dead on April 24th. The autopsy of Ruthie showed that she had been shot four times with the fourth shot being fatal and that it was done with a medium caliber weapon. She was shot once in the shoulder, once in the thigh, once in the stomach, and the fourth and final bullet went through her upper arm and pierced her pulmonary vein. The medical examiner noted that Ruthie probably didn't die instantly, but that even if she had tried to make it to the hospital, it wouldn't have been enough time. So the story that was able to be pieced together after Ruthie's body was found was a very odd one to say the least. So it appeared that in the Grace Abbott home, there were four apartments on each floor whose bathrooms were built back to back, right? And this meant that the medicine cabinets lined up back to back. And the only thing separating those two apartments were the mirror and six flimsy nails holding the mirror up. The design was innocent enough. It was made so that people could access the plumbing when they needed to, although it was quickly used for things other than its designed purpose. It had become a problem way before Ruthie called the police. There were many stories and incidents reported where people would just waltz in to these people's apartments through the medicine cabinet. So it was quickly determined that this was how the two murderers got into Ruthie's apartment building that night. These people most likely came into Ruthie's house to rob her, but ended up killing her in the process. A few days after Ruthie's body was found, police arrested 19-year-old Edward Turner, and then on June 9th, police arrested 25-year-old John Hondras for the murder of Ruthie Mae McCoy. Both men were unemployed and both men lived in the ABL homes. The motive was thought to be money as a lot of different people had seen Ruthie in her newly bought clothes and so she was likely an easy target for the men. They were charged with murder, armed violence, armed robbery, residential burglary, and home invasion. That being said, all of the charges were dropped in 1990 and the case remains unsolved to this day. And unfortunately, it will probably stay that way. The unfortunate thing about cases like this is that people that do have information usually don't come forward because either they're scared or they don't want to get involved and that's totally understandable, especially when you think of people living in that time in that place. It definitely makes sense why people didn't come forward with information. Additionally, there wasn't much news coverage on this case for obvious reasons. The only people that really decided to cover this case was a black-owned newspaper called The Defender, and there was also a very small little article in the Chicago Tribune when John Hondras was taken into custody. I would like to think that if Ruthie's case happened today, that there would have been some sort of justice for her, but based on how the world is right now, I'm not so sure. It was actually the 1992 film Candyman that brought some semblance of light to Ruthie's story. If you guys watched my video on the Gainesville Ripper, then you probably know that I've been watching a lot of scary movies, a lot of horror movies. So right after I watched Scream, I decided that I wanted to watch Candyman and cover Ruthie's story. So if you don't know the plot of Candyman, that's okay. I'll walk you through it. It's basically about this woman named Helen and she is writing a thesis on an urban legend in the Chicago area called Candyman. Much like other boogeymen, Candyman can be summoned by saying his name five times in front of a mirror. One night, Helen and her friend decide to summon Candyman and chaos ensues. There are lots of elements from this movie that I think are super important to the culture and to the story of Ruthie Mae McCoy. For instance, a lot of this film takes place in Cabrini Green, which is actually located very, very close to the ABL homes. Not only that, but they actually use the symbolism of the mirror, the symbolism of kind of opening medicine cabinet and going through that as entering this terrible, horrible place. I think that this movie also does an awesome job of showing what people living in the projects are struggling through, 
what some of their fears are. And while in the movie, it's Candyman, this sort of boogeyman, in the projects, it was real violence and real terror. This boogeyman could literally come through your cabinet door on a random April night. And it, it's terrifying and it's real. And I think that that's what makes Candyman so interesting. And if you haven't seen it, I highly suggest you do. There's a remake too. I have not seen that one, but I've heard good things about that one as well. So I'm sure that that would also be a good watch. I know that this was probably a heavy topic to talk about. And I know that me talking about it probably doesn't do it justice. I kind of went into it as best as I could with the information that I could find. But again, I am not an expert by far on things like... Um, culture and struggles that people might be going through so i hope that i was able to kind of accurately portray ruthie may's story i hope that you guys are having a great day it was just daylight savings so i hope that you guys enjoyed your extra hour of sleep that being said make sure that you guys are getting some sunlight getting some good old vitamin d okay keep that seasonal oppression out right keep it out. Bad vibes. Okay. Anyway, keep being the bad bitches that you are. Okay, guys? Bye.